Now, the reason why I think we need to begin with a clarification over the things that are not is because when you look at this afternoon's experience and assuming that he's going to get another one, Super Bowl, um, you look at the celebration, you look at what it takes to get there. And uh, for us, uh, as, a, as, a, as a family, you know, raising three kids in high school, we only have one now left, but the other two are uh, now are in college. Um, this year, for the first time since we've been, you know, with, with our children in high school, our football team went all the way to the semifinals statewide. So we have never tasted something like this at a high school level. I know that Donna High School went all the way to win the championship back in the 60s, I think. But anyway, so for us, it was a breakthrough to see our kids, you know, high school football kid, but kids. But obviously, this is a different conversation, the level of um, competition and commitment. And, and, and you, may, you may have your own perception and opinions why people get to these places. There is debates between if he were to play for somebody else, would he still have that many championships? Or would uh, the coach of the New England Patriots, if he had a different, you know, uh, quarterback, all these conversations are legit and, and they're good to have. But here's the bottom line. Everything that is behind the competition of a sport, in this case, football, because today is Super Bowl, what is behind, and, and for this guy was in 2000, if I'm not mistaken, is a contract. They have to sign a contract because the contract is a legal binding that actually creates and produces the, the structure or the system that eventually takes you to these possibilities of winning to the highest of competition. When it comes to the series that we finished in the month of January, we spoke of the church, we spoke of the theology of the church, we spoke of the doctrine of the church, we spoke of the structure of the church, we spoke of leadership in the church, and I hope and you can come back to understand that the church, although there might be a contractual component, and specifically when we celebrated water baptisms and those who were welcome into the member membership of the church, there might be a contractual component, just like in sports, but it's beyond contract. When it comes to God, God goes beyond contracts. In other words, in contracts, and this is why God is different, in contracts, you are expected to perform or to do what you promise or you sign on the dotted line for. So in this case, uh, whoever wins today, as you know, they're going to get some bonuses, financially speaking, but then they're going to get a lot of this kind of uh, endorsements, and you're going to see them in a bunch of TV programs. And if it's Tom Brady, the one who wins, obviously... Just building the legacy. And there's a lot of perks on that regard. That is not how it works with God. It, it includes some of those components, but it goes beyond. And let me, let me explain to you why. And I hope and you, and you agree with me and you are happy and, and glad that I'm about to tell you this. You don't want to deal with God at a contract level. Because if, see, in contractual relationships, we want to see fairness. We want to see equality. We want to be inclusive. We want to see things balance, you know, when it comes to racial, social, family, financial issues, immigration, you know, components in, in, in the country and things like that. Good conversation to have. In the economy of God, you don't want God to be fair. Because if God were to be fair, he will give you justice. He will give me what I deserve. And the last time that I check. What I deserve, what you deserve, is not heaven, but hell. This is why you don't want for God to be just. You don't want to exercise fairness and equality. What we want, and this is where we're going for the next few minutes, we want the grace and the mercy of God. Because the people who were no people through God, by the grace and mercy of God, became people. For those who were far away from God and we were enemies of God, through Jesus Christ, we're brought into a relationship. So thousands of years prior to the celebration of that Lord's Supper, prior to the celebration of Passover, in other words, the exit of the Israelites, which were not Israelites yet, but the Hebrew community, exiting Egypt towards the Promised Land, hundreds and thousands of years prior to that, there's a conversation where the concept of covenantal relationship, not just contractual, but covenantal begun. So if you have a Bible, go to the book of Genesis, chapter 15, and beginning on verse 1, you're going to see how God initiates this conversation. And the Bible says, after this, what's the this? 14, 13, 12, I mean, you go back into the previous chapters, which we're not going to read. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. If the relationship was Contractual versus covenantal. If it was a contract like the NFL, like professional sports, like your job and your employee or your employer, whatever the case may be, 
Then the Bible will say something like this. The word, or in this case, Abraham was looking for the word of the Lord. The Bible doesn't say that Abraham was looking for God. The Bible says that God came to Abraham. What's the point? That when it comes to covenants, they're always based on who God is, not the need that we have for God. And this is extremely important because look at how the word chooses a guy that if you as a church were looking for a pastor, if you were looking for a youth pastor, if your daughter was looking to date somebody, you don't want this guy. He's a pagan priest. He's not a guy that is seeking for the God of the scriptures. He is a guy that is worshiping, you know, a multiplicity of deities in this time in history. And I'm about to prove to you that his resume is not the most appealing on that when it comes to behavior, when it comes to, again, hearing or deserving to hear from God. You see the doctrine of election, predestination at his best when it comes to God speaking to Abraham. Because God is giving Abraham something that he needs versus what he deserves. So I'm going to say this again. Stop thinking that God must be equal, just, fair with us. You don't want the fairness of God. You don't want equality with God. You want the mercy of God. Well, in this case, the mercy is that he's given through a vision. So the word vision, you know, visions, dreams, the way that they, they perceive this, it's like, it's like getting a text today. It's like getting a message that is very, very common to read or to perceive. So God becomes a missionary. God is just speaking in his grace in a manner that Abraham is able to understand. And this is what he says. He says, I need you to stop being afraid. In other words, he's not saying, I hope and you never get afraid. But when you engage into a covenantal relationship with God, not a contractual, covenantal, the first thing that happens, listen to me, the first thing that happens is that you are aware and you are fully capable to understand that the first thing that God provides into your life is not an improvement of your life. It's not simply that in this case, as you know the story, some of you may know, the issue for Abraham, the problem for Abraham is barrenness. That the wife has not, is not able to conceive children, which is a curse in this time in history. But secondly, is the age. Is that these people, Abraham and the wife, they're old. So biologically, the, the, the clock is, is kind of a, you know, which is a quick commercial. You need to get married young. So don't, anyways. So it's just that component that these people are beyond the ability to conceive children. So God doesn't just show himself and simply give him a child. The child is going to come, and we'll talk about it in just a second. But the first thing that happens when God shows up in a covenantal manner is that he creates fear. So, so hear me say this, and some of you need to write this down, maybe text it to somebody. The problem with our church, with our families, with our nation, is that we do not fear God. We domesticate God. We have uh, Mr. Rogers, Dr. Field, and then God. Oh, and Oprah is probably somewhere in the conversation. At that level, that's where God is for many of us. We do not fear God. We do not think of the consequences. We typically read Matthew chapter 25, right? The parable of the talents, the parable of the uh, wise and unwise um, wives or ladies. Remember with the oil? Five were wise, five were... We read those parables and we think that those parables are for the non-believers. Those parables are for Christians, those parables that when the Bible says about the rejection is the concept that there will be consequences to the Christian community when we stop fearing God in a sense of the holiness and the majesty and the glory of God. So hear me say this very clearly. The covenants with God, whether it's your salvation, whether it's your regeneration, whether it's your relationship with God, must begin with a sense of fear. We fear the Lord in a sense of, here's what I mean by fear. Remember the story? In the boat, in the middle of the sea, a storm hits the disciples. Jesus is taking a nap. Finally, wakes Jesus up. Jesus shows up. The disciples are fearful that they're going to drown. They're going to die. Jesus shows up, gets up from the nap, and then calms the waters, calms the sea, calms the wind. And they go from simply fearing to die now with a sense of terror, with a sense that it's something beyond comprehension. And that's what we're describing here. Now, watch, watch, watch the beauty of the conversation. That's one side of the conversation, the justice, the wrath, the awesomeness, the holiness of God is present and creates a sense of fear. But the flip side of that is that God tells Abraham, I am your, in other words, I am not your cosmic butler. I'm not here to be the God that if you listen to my word and you understand my vision, nothing wrong is going to happen to you. All that he's saying is that when things do not go your way, I'm going to be your protection. But you're still going to get hit. 
So stop thinking that if you're listening from God, that if you're in a relationship with God and you fear the Lord, it's so God can become your cosmic butler. It's that God is just your, your pal, your friend. No, that's not God. God promises to be your shield. And then look at this. At the end of the conversation, at the end of the whole journey, and it's going to be a long journey, and it's going to be a beautiful journey that eventually is going to bring Isaac, and Isaac creates a family, and the family, you know, Jacob, in this case, the son, and then he's going to have 12 children, and those 12 guys become the 12 tribe of Israel. And out of Israel, there's, there's a seed, there's a component that Jesus shows up. It's a beautiful thing, but what, what's the win? The win is not the the win is not the absence absence of the problems. The win is not that you have simply moving from 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 a very irreverent relationship to a fearful relationship relationship with God. The win is that God becomes your reward. So this morning, if you're taking notes, I want you to know that you begin the covenantal relationship by understanding who you are. What is the condition of Abraham? And I'm going to say this again. The challenge for most people in America is that we do not mind approaching, seeking, praying, asking for God, as long as God simply makes me like an iPhone, you know, from 5 to 6 to 7, and now today is at 10. So you just want to have any improvements in the capacity and your condition. That's not God. What he does is he reveals who he is, and who God is is the God that between verses 1 and 5, Abraham is going to, interact with God and basically he says the following I know that I need to fear you I know that you are my shield and I know that you are my greatest reward but here's the problem my wife is barren I'm in a situation that is beyond my ability that there, we have come to the place where there is nothing we can do and God is going to reply by saying this God takes him outside and he said God tells Abraham look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them I want you to understand this. So shall your offspring will be. So once you understand who you are in the presence of God, look at the, the, the majesty and the presence of God. I, I don't know if you can make the connection to the beginning of our series last month, but we began in the book of Colossians by speaking of the supremacy of Jesus over the cosmos, over over everything that is created. And then eventually Paul took us into the supremacy of everything. And then he says he's also supreme and Lord over the church. And that's what we went for the entire month. But make the connection with the sky and the stars and how God is simply utilizing those as a symbolism to remind him of who he is. Once you understand who God is, you will understand who you are. What happens as a result of those things? The most beautiful thing happens to the life of Abraham. The Bible says in chapter 15, verse 6, that, uh, I mean, I, again, I wish that was the case, but verse 16 is not the verse that says that Abraham got a text with a picture, and Sarah, in that moment, sent the little picture with the little stick with the two lines that she was pregnant. That's not what he got. The Bible doesn't say that in that moment, something just, just supernatural took place in the life of this older lady by the name of Sarah. All that the Bible says is that Abraham was empowered to do what? To believe. That's all that he, he understood that if God is to be feared, that if God is to be my shield, so now it becomes personal, and then he's my greatest reward. The question now comes. Here's the question. How do I relate to a God that is to be feared? How do I relate to a God that is not going to be my cosmic butler? So I cannot, I can never look at God and say, like a contract, you didn't deliver the goods. So some of the arguments with the Super Bowl is that there will be many players playing today. Many players that this is literally a one shot in a lifetime. They will never get into a Super Bowl again, unless you're Tom Brady, but most people are not. So once in a lifetime, based on a contract, because contracts, look at me, contracts at the NFL after tonight will not be renewed. And sometimes we treat God like that. Sometimes we look at God and says, okay, I'm going to fear you. I'm going to revere you. I'm going to worship you as long as you do the other part of the contract. That's not God. So Abraham understands those things and says, okay, so he's to be feared. He's to be my shield, not my cosmic butler. And then he is my greatest of rewards. How do I relate to that? How do you make it happen? By trusting in the trustworthiness of God. So most people in a contractual environment, they believe in God. People in a covenantal relationship believe God. 
So I don't know where you are in this scenario, and I hope and you're not just settling to believe God in God. I want you to believe in God. But would it be possible that in moments where you experience barrenness financially, barrenness relationally, and the marriage is not working, maybe barrenness in your emotions and you are drawn and you are, you are drowned in fear, Maybe the doctor's, you know, uh, uh, kind of a diagnosis is taking you away from the holiness of God and from revering God and, and seeing God as a shield. Maybe this is the morning where you, you, where, where you, where the conversation begins is that you ask the Lord Jesus to give you the ability to believe the Father the way he believed the Father. The Bible says that he believed, and because of this ability to believe, that's when God, who is to be fear, right? We just said that. God is to be fear. God went, God went from being lethal and detrimental to become beneficial. I, I gave you this illustration before, and I'm going to give it to you again. Electricity, electricity is beneficial because it's grounded. If you do not ground electricity, it potentially can kill you, electrocute you. So for God to be beneficial... You have to put your trust in Jesus. Without faith, God will consume you. And when you put your trust in Jesus, the win is not that things change. The win is that you change. What kind of a change? Here's the beauty of the change. The change is that you will stop, you will stop becoming, continue to be a slave of improvement. I'm going to say that again. God is not in the business of taking you from point A to point B to point C to achieving, the to achieving the American dream. I'm not against you working hard and having plans and dreams. My question, our question when it comes to Abram is that Abram needs to move from simply an improvement of his condition, of his health, of his barrenness, to understand that if you are going to relate to the God who is to be feared, if you're going to know God as a shield versus a cosmic butler, and you're going to be able to see him as the best or the greatest reward in your life, you have to become righteous. Not just innocent, but righteous. So for us, here's where the conversation takes a different direction for me because of this concept of improvement and this relationship with Abraham and God. And, and for me, I want you to think for a second what's about to happen. Because this is chapter 15, verse 6. He believed and he was made righteous. Did you know that it's going to take 25 years, almost as long as the Cowboys have not won a Super Bowl, about 25 years, it's going to take before Isaac shows up. The promise is Isaac. What's my point? Here's my point. Here's my point. So we're in chapter 15. And the first thing that this guy is going to do, he's going to go and speak to Sarah. Sarah is going to mock him and say, you're a fool. You're crazy. And Sarah says, okay, if God promised that, let me give you my servant, Hagar. Go and lay down with her. And she gets pregnant and brings forth a, not a girl, but a boy. His name, the name of the boy is Ishmael. What's the point? That between... Chapter 15, verse 6, to the arrival of Isaac, 25 years later, it is craziness, brokenness, betrayal. I told you from the beginning, you don't want this guy as your pastor. You, don't, you won't ordain this guy as a deacon. You don't want this guy to date your girls, Abram, because he's a liar. He's, a, he's, a, he's an idol worshiper. He has a bad reputation, a dysfunctional family, and yet God chooses this brother to become the father of a nation, the father of the faith, and eventually, 25 years later, Isaac is going to show up the promised, being fulfilled that God gave at the very beginning to Abraham. If you fast forward the movie, if you go into a couple of thousand years later, you have a guy by the name of Paul, the apostle Paul, and he's dealing with the church, the church of Corinth, and the church of Corinth is a church that they have believed, but they have moved backwards from believing so they can live in righteousness. They have moved backwards. They have moved from a covenantal relationship. They have moved into a contractual relationship. And this is how Paul deals with the church. That isn't that lapse between, between chapter 15, verse 6, to 25 years later. Because I think that's where we are. We, we, we've been, we have believed. We have been made righteous. But, man, we're not there yet. The promise had not been fulfilled. We're kind of a, in that process. What do we do in the meantime? This is, this is what Paul says to the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, quickly. In the following directives, this is Paul speaking to a church that is going through a lot of disarray. I have no praise for you. And this is why. This is why I cannot praise you. Because your gatherings 
So if you look at our little handout, we have three. So picture three services. Three services that they do more harm than they do any time that you move in a marriage relationship, in a parental relationship, from a covenant to a contractual, marriages that move into a contractual is basically self-inflicted pain. Churches that do that. What's the point? It's when you look at your wife and you look at your children and your driving force is basically this. You owe me. You owe me. You owe me. And you have the list why people owe you. You have the list why you are entitled to fill in the blank. Look at what's happening. See, the problem is not the meetings. The meetings are needed. The worshiping is needed in, in corporal manner. The issues that they have become harmful versus beneficial. Look at what happens. Verse 18. In the first place, he's got a list, okay? I hear that when you come together as a church, the body, he's the head, you're the body, says there are divisions among you. And to some extent, Here's what I believe it. I believe it because when, when you move from a contractual, from a covenantal relationship to a contractual commitment, you, you look at the, you make the goal to avoid division. So what you try to strive is not unity, but uniformity. That explains why, unfortunately, churches typically only attract people like them. Have you heard that? Have you seen that before? The beauty of this church is that we are not only diverse culturally, we're not only diverse generationally, we, I, I can argue that we're diverse even theologically. And I'm not saying that that's good necessarily, but all that I'm saying is that for me the conversation is that the antidote of division is not simply the fact that we just get alone, that we just you know, like each other, which is important. For me, is we, we don't strive for uniformity. We don't strive for simply people that I relate to people that think like me, behave like me, act like me. Have you noticed with Jesus that he attracted exactly the opposite of people? That he, who he was and how he believed and how he went about? See, the Bible says that they have divisions among themselves. And he says, I believe those. No doubt, he says on verse 19, there have been differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So eventually... True colors come into place. So then, when you come together, once again, you come together, and, and, you, and you come for the purpose to celebrate the supper, the Lord's Supper, see, you're not doing that. Because what you have done, when you move from a covenantal relationship to a contractual, this will be the same thing as if you, as a married person, you start fighting for the marriage instead of fighting for your spouse. I've said it many, many times. You do not, you should not fight for the marriage. Why? Because you can always build a marriage with somebody else. The point is not to be married. The point is, is the girl. Remember that? It's always about the girl. Have you seen movies lately? It's, so, it's about saving the girl. So in marriage, guys, it's always about the girl. It's not about being married. Marriage is means to, and it, marry for me is means to the girl, right? It's just how you get to the girl. So in this case, they have fallen in love with the marriage, not with the, what's the win? The win is not the celebration of the Lord's Supper. The win is a relationship with Christ that they have moved away from. So when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. And as a result of your individualism, you know, meism, entitlement, self-indulgence, one person remains hungry and another person gets drunk. Verse 22. So here's a question. Don't you have homes to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? So apparently what he's doing, he's reminding them that there is no separation between God and his church. That when you are driven by contractual mindset, you, you start dividing you know, who God is and who his, the church is. So what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And he finishes by simply establishing a resounding no. So the church is in trouble. The people of God is in trouble in Genesis. Both are in trouble. Old Testament trouble. New Testament is in trouble. What's the answer, guys? How do we fix this craziness? How do we make America great again? How do we bring the church back into the Christ-likeness centrality of the gospel? Glad you asked. I was going that direction. Here's how we do it. Verse 17 of chapter 15. God speaks to Abraham. And he says, everything I just gave you, Abraham, because Abraham is getting concerned. So my wife is barren. I'm old. How do we get this thing going? I mean, we've been trying having children. And, and I love to have the stars, you know, constellations as a symbolism of, of my generations to come. And, and God says, hold your horses, buddy. 
I know you're American. I know you're driven. I know you're a go-getter. I know you got things to do, places to go, people to see. But let me remind you how this works. The covenant that is made today with you, translate that into your salvation, you being saved, is not based on your performance. It's based on the performance that when the son had said, chapter 15, go back to Abram. When the son had said, darkness came into place. So, so translate that into the experience of the circumcision. The, the actual cutting of the flesh of Abraham for circumcised is a symbolism. The circumcision is a symbolism that God is telling Abraham, this covenant that we're making, if you were to fail, that's exactly what's going to happen. You'll be cut off of the fellowship. If you were to violate this covenant, this covenantal relationship, please listen to me, is based on my unconditional love for you. It's not, it's not an unconditional relationship with you. Parents, we love children unconditionally, great. We must not relate to our spouses unconditionally. The point that he's trying to make is that the darkness is the symbolism that if you were to fail me, you're out. I will cut you off. Had fallen a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch. Remember that God is a consuming fire? That God is the column of fire for the people of Israel in the wilderness. That cloud during the day is the, is, is the presence of God and a symbolism. So apparently what is happening is that God has commanded Abram to set up a, a, a little pathway, a little aisle with, with the sacrificial system of animals. And the blood is literally put into between. This is the way they did covenants in this time. So there is blood involved. 2,000 years ago, there was blood involved. A marriage a marriage, blood involved, right? The first night, blood involved. Look at me for a second. There is, there, is the, there is the presence of God that God is basically saying, Abraham, the beauty of the gospel is not the covenant. The beauty of the gospel is simply the vehicle to remind you that who is going to walk through that blood, through those animals being sacrificed, is not Abraham, but God. And just the way that he demanded for Abraham to experience that circumcision, and to remind him that if you were to violate this covenant, you are out. God is doing exactly the same. When God passed between the pieces, God is the one who walked. God is basically saying, as I walk this path, Abram, I need you to know that if I were not to fulfill this covenant, it's going to take 25 years for Isaac to show up, the son. I want you to know that I am swearing on my very essence. I will stop being God. I will become from the eternal to the temporal. I will stop being the God of all creation if I ever violate. The, so the covenantal relationship is mutual in that regard. 2,000 years ago, there was a Jewish carpenter that passed between the pieces. The only difference is that the pieces were not goats, were not lambs. His body was broken. His blood was shed. So what you're about to do today is simply to remember that the covenant that God created for your salvation is not based on you improving your behavior. It's not based on how well you did in 2018. The covenant of the Lord's Supper is based on the reality that Jesus is in the upper room and as he is about to walk the Via Dolorosa and his body is about to be cut into pieces and his blood is going to be shed for the redemption of the world, he's reminding his disciples that this is the moment where in the, in the past, God began the conversation through prophets, through priests, and through kings. For the first time, God is given a family member. Because he doesn't just want you to go to heaven. He wants you. It's not about just avoiding hell. It's about you. That 2,000 years ago, the covenant of the Lord's Supper is a reminder that this whole deal is because of men and women matter to God. That in spite of our condition and circumstances, in spite of how broken we might be, in spite of that we may be in that period of 25 years, maybe your marriage and my marriage looks like the church in, in Corinth that we're just broken and crazy and dysfunctional and sometimes we feel that life was better before we came to church 
Sometimes it was better before I get into this Christian thing or this is why I don't become a Christian. Whatever you are in this regard, can I just ask you to remind yourself this morning that if you were to partake today about this experience of the Lord's Supper is to remind yourself that the covenants of God are never based on you because life is not about you. Life is not about me. Life is about the sacrifice of Jesus that 2,000 years ago, He invited you to have this relationship with Him.